I had the privilege of being in one of our TV stations, TV 47. And uh, we were three panelists, and we had 14 young people from the different universities in this country, student leaders in the different universities. And you know, university, uh, student leaders don't take prisoners. Generally, they don't take prisoners. And uh, there was a little girl in her early 20s. She looked straight into my eyes. She wasn't blinking. And she wasn't joking either. <laughs> she looked straight into my eyes and she said, Bishop, I need you to know this. When we are done with the government, we are coming for the church. And you can look for the clip. She was actually pointing at me. She said... <laughs> We are coming for you. <laughs> My heart was broken. But it's interesting. We have prayed many times here. And you have prayed, many of you, for corruption in this country. That Lord, finish corruption. And we have prayed for the church of Jesus Christ, that there will be revival. But you know you can't tell Jesus how the revival should come or how he should deal with corruption. If you are given a thousand opportunities to get how God would deal with corruption, none of us would have picked Gen Z. They were not on the list of options. Even in that others for others, he couldn't have fitted. But see what, what's happening. So for sure, God's ways are not our ways. Can we agree there? His ways are not. And his ways are higher than. Us is to entrust ourselves to him. Because he is good. Now, today is communion Sunday. I don't know how many of you, are, you're born again. Your heart is right and you desire to share in the Lord's table and you do not have the elements with you. If you do not, please proceed to the back, either of the entrances, <coughs> and, and collect. If it's just one of you, I think we have an extra one here. My sister, you don't have to go all the way. Yeah, Pastor Mutu. Oh, two. Yeah, we have two extra ones. Yes, I have. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <coughs> So before we prepare, let me share something. Hosea 4.6, the Bible says this. My people perish for lack of. <clears throat> now, it also says, in your anger do not sin. In your anger. Now, many of you in this season have sinned. In your anger, you have been sent things that resonate with your heart and you have forwarded them. Now, it's important to remember this. At the point you are forwarding it, it means that you agree with it, and you take full responsibility for that article that you are, that you are sending. You've owned it, and you take full responsibility in heaven and on earth. Before God and man, I take full responsibility for this article as you send it. It is important for you to remember. Now, whether that clip glorifies God or not, that's up to you to decide. But if you are to go back to your social media footprint and look through what you have forwarded and ask yourself, does this clip glorify God? Is the language here even glorifying God? The literature, the language here, does it glorify God? One, a few days ago, in the middle of the night, I had an idea. And I woke up quickly so that I don't forget. I had a statement I wanted to make. And I quickly wrote it down on a piece of paper. And it resonated with my heart. And in that statement, there were two words. Fool and idiot. Were part of the statement I was going to make. 
And then I slept. I have captured it. So in the morning, I will send it to our media team. They play around with it and color it red or red background and send it. But before sleep came, I had a small still voice ask me, will that statement glorify me? And you know what the Bible says about calling another a fool? In fact, what does the Bible say? Do not call anyone a fool. So right there, I had contravened scripture. Did it resonate with my heart? 150%. 150%. But was it the right thing to do? As a believer, no. So I woke up. And I canceled the entire statement. Canceled it. And it's at that point that the Lord spoke to me that many of us have sinned. Because you have forwarded things that don't glorify God in your anger. A clip. And you are not the originator. You, you, you didn't. You're not the one who came up with it. You read it. I won't say it blessed you, it just resonated with you. And you forwarded it. Friends, I think it is important for you to remember that you are first, before you are a Kenyan, you are a Christian. Before you are a Kenyan, you are born again. Born as Fesana. Our commonwealth, our citizenship, is first in heaven. And so before we share in the Lord's table, I want us to repent. I want us to repent. And I want us to come to the place where before you forward anything, think. And think as a believer first, not as a Kenyan. Because this season will come and go. I can guarantee you, we've been here before. It will pass. The temperatures will settle. But the Lord will not forget. Because our God is not seasonal. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we raise a prayer of repentance this morning. Because we are your children. And your word says to us in Matthew chapter 5 that blessed are the peacemakers for they are the ones that you, Jehovah, will call your children. And I pray today that we shall be called your children because it is only your children that inherit the kingdom of God. Father, forgive us. Forgive us that in our anger we have sinned. That in our anger, we have said things that we regret. In our anger, we have not honored you. In anger, we have not walked in holiness and in righteousness. So that as we share and as we commemorate the birth and the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we shall not do it in an unworthy manner. Forgive us, almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us prepare slowly so that you do not soil yourself. Slowly. And then after you're finished, please put uh, the container under your seat so that people do not trip on it. Slowly. <coughs> Sorry. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the bread together. And the juice. Let's go before the Lord in your own words. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you and bless you and declare that you are God alone. Minister to our hearts and be exalted in all that we do. And thank you for forgiving us. May you help us, Almighty God, for we submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said earlier, if you just, when you're done, please put those cups under your seat so that at, at the point of exit, someone doesn't trip on them. Praise the Lord. Before we get into the reading of, of Scripture, I'd like to pray with anyone. You, you are here today and, and you're saying, Pastor, I need someone to pray with me. As our teenagers are going to teens and youth church. <coughs> Anyone this morning who's saying, I need someone to pray with me. Just come to the altar and I will pray with you. Remember, we pray. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. You pray and keep believing and trusting until the Lord comes. And he will come. He's the one who said, keep praying. Pray without ceasing. Pray. Keep seeking. Asking. Our Lord answers prayer. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Father. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I thank you for everyone on this altar this morning, this afternoon. Father, you know every need by name. You know even before we speak what that need is. You know exactly where it hurts. And you know exactly how to get out of the situation that we are in. Father, only you can make a way because you are our Father who art in heaven. And so our Father who art in heaven, we, your children, are in need. And we desire that, Lord, you come through for us and meet us where we are at our point of need according to your riches in glory. Because you have never lost a battle and this won't be your first. So I submit everyone and every need every petition to you, O Lord, in humility and in brokenness, Almighty God, because we know that you can. So, Lord, thank you that we have a place to run to and we have a Father who hears and our Father who is present 
a father who cares, a father who loves, and our father who can. So we are honored and blessed this morning because you are Father Jehovah. So Lord, I dedicate all of us, your children, back to you and the needs before us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Receive from the Lord. As you sit, let me ask us to open our Bibles kindly. The book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we are reading from verse 1 to 8. As we stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and for those who are visiting us, thank you for choosing to worship with us today. There are many churches on this side of the city, but you chose here. And so we are honored and blessed to have you as our visitors. So, Romans chapter 12. And verse 1 to 8. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Reading from the New King James Version. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exalts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. In Jesus' name we read. Amen. Please have your seats kindly. When you hear the word sacrifice, you think of an altar and fire and a sacrifice that is being consumed by that fire. But here is removed from the norm. Because Paul is telling the Romans, he's urging them. Even when you listen to the language, I beseech you, is a strong word. He's urging them strongly that to present themselves by the mercies of God as a living sacrifice. So you are a sacrifice that is not dead. Because for a sacrifice to be put on the altar, it must be dead must have shed blood so that it can be consumed by fire. But now he's saying, present yourself to God as a sacrifice that is living and whole. Which means, you see, when you're presenting a sacrifice, when you're laying a sacrifice on an altar, it's at a specific place. It is not mobile. In fact, if that altar, that altar with fire was mobile, that that would be dangerous. (laughs) But he's saying, be a sacrifice that is alive. It means that wherever you go, you are a sacrifice on the altar of the Lord. Behave like one. But for that sacrifice to be acceptable, it must be holy. 
Yes, it's alive, but it must be holy. So that it is acceptable before the Lord. In fact, there are certain portions of scripture that say, that is an acceptable worship. When you present yourself as a living sacrifice before the Lord, and it is by the grace of God, then, and only then, when it is holy, is it acceptable and a reasonable worship before the Lord. Friends, the Lord is urging us to be believers everywhere, every day, all the time. Whether you're at work, at home, social functions, you're a believer. You, we are believers. We are followers of Christ. Last Sunday, we started talking about giving. And I remember sharing with you and saying, you know, the lowest form of giving is shillings and cents. But it's interesting because every time you hear the word giving, you think money. But the Lord, the first thing the Lord desires from you is not your money. is your heart. That you give your heart to God as an unbeliever so that the Lord can dwell in your heart. And that process is called salvation. And then the next step is for you to allow him to be Lord over your heart. Where you allow the Lord to sit on the driver's seat of your heart. So it is he who controls your life. <coughs> so it becomes your identity. Where we say that Jesus Christ is my savior and my Lord. Or my Lord and savior. But there are many of us who Jesus is only Savior, not Lord. But he demands of us that if he is your Savior, then he must be Lord. Now, that's the first level. And we talked about it last week. Now, today, we are talking about giving of yourself. You've already given your heart. Jesus Christ is Lord and is Lord, is Savior. And he's also Lord, so he's controlling your heart. And because he is Lord, then you offer your body now as a living sacrifice. That's the second level of giving. You give of your service, of yourself. Because faith without wax is dead. And dead faith does not inherit the kingdom of God. So wherever you are, you are serving God with your body, with your abilities, with your mind with your skills, you are doing it unto the Lord. You know, there are people who you cannot correlate between your workplace and church and spirituality. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Whether you have a boss that is difficult or a nice boss, wherever you are, whatever circumstances that you are, do it unto the Lord. Now, recently... I've been believing God for a miracle. <coughs> and as I'm believing God for a miracle, you know how you say, God, I want you to come and I don't want you to send anyone. Come yourself. Now, as you're believing God, and all of us here are believing God for something or the other, there's a portion of scripture, and you know, the Lord still speaks to us. That, that still small voice is very stubborn. And by the way, it's so firm. You, you just know it's the Lord. It's not shouting, but, but you, there's a conviction you had. This is the Lord. Now, I am believing God. And, and you're asking the Lord, Father, I have believed you for this. I have believed you. God, I have sought you with everything. And then, as, as we are deliberating over this thing, and you know, you are almost borderline complaining. Because you're feeling like the Lord is overlooking. And, and many of us, once or, in, you know, at some point in life, you, you're on that street. You know, almost complaining street. So the Lord takes me <coughs> to Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. And scripture says this. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. And I'm telling the Lord, I have sought you with my whole heart. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the Lord speaks to us, me, for me, he speaks to me in, with stories. And so the Lord takes me back into history. And I've just met Carol, and she's in Desta University, I'm East African School of Theology. She's doing uh, a course. <laughs> Communication and uh, Community Development as a minor. That course. And me, I'm doing theology. So me, I'm heaven bound. Anyway, just joking. <laughs> and now, she has just said yes. And my heart is in cloud nine. But there's a challenge. Her father doesn't like me much. And, she is, he, and, and he's, not, he's not subtle about it. I don't know, how many of you remember those father-in-laws, you know? Before mobile phones. Before God came through for brothers in Jesus' name. Nowadays, these young people, I don't even know what stresses them. Dating is easy. Doesn't matter whether he buys a dog or not. He can own 10 guns. Who cares? There is WhatsApp. I thought, oh, the teenagers have gone. They would have been amens here. So anyway... So, Carlos' dad doesn't like me much, and he's, uh, he's not shying away from that fact, like many of you here. And so, I, I, this chick has said, yes, I'm trying to find every waking minute to spend time with her. But there's a huge stumbling block, and the Lord doesn't look like he's able to move this guy. You know, he's, he's standing in the way of my happiness. And she, she has a deadline. By 6.30, she must be home. Latest, as in cut-off time, is 7. She must be in the house. So we must make the best of this time. Now, I have a challenge because I am in Buruburu, and she's in Valley Road. You know where Desta University is? At the opposite to the city mortuary, there. Now, she is in the Athi River campus. And so the bus leaves Athi River at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And they are here by 4.30 or 5, latest, at Athi River. I mean, at Valley Road. <coughs> so that's the only time I have to hang out with this girl who looks like the sun, at least in my opinion just in case you have ideas. So, I have to leave Burburu, get into a matatu that is moving very quickly. So I'll get into those 36 matatus from Dandora, because they're trying to get to City Stadium quickly. And then when I get to Jogorod, I get into a 33 coming from Embakasi. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a student, so I'm broke. So I'm trying to negotiate for five bob, you know, you get in, and they are, all the seats are empty, but because you're paying five bob, you can't sit. Because if you dare sit on those Dandora Matatus, you pay ten bob. But who cares about sitting? Who cares about sitting? I don't care whether they are people or not. Me, I'm standing and I'm happy. So I get to Jogorod, I quickly get into a 33, and it goes straight to Bomb Blast Roundabout. And I'm telling you, whether it stops or not, I'm out of that Nissan. And I ran like a madman, literally ran, all the way from that roundabout, literally, I'm telling you, Sister Jemaimba, like a thief. <laughs> I am telling you, in fact, I wonder why I was ne no one ever chased me. I am telling, the grace of God is real. I'm, I tell you, I ran. <coughs> All the way to Helsilasi roundabout, and then up that hill. In fact, I never used to realize there was a hill. <laughs> Kenyatta Hospital, straight across the road, and whoop, into Desta. 
I get there and I quickly go to the toilet and I gather t- tissue paper and I'm wiping my sweat. I have my secret roll on here. I quickly, eh, I look at the part and I'm catching my breath. And then I hear the bus has come and I come out. She steps out of the bus like this and I'm there. Wow. <laughs> so uh, we greet each other because in those days you never used to hug. Hugs were for the devil. How far have we fallen? <laughs> so you could tell people who are saved and those who are not. The, the unbelievers were hugging, the believers were shaking hands. You didn't have to say praise the Lord. You could tell sinners and believers. So we never played around with the flesh. Praise the Lord, Sister Caro. <laughs> Sister Caro says, praise the Lord, Brother Tony. So anyway, then from there on, we would walk all the way to town. And that was glorious and heavenly. You know, we would walk and enjoy and talk. And we would feel like we would walk all the way to Eastlands. In fact, we never noticed traffic. We never noticed our people. It was like there was no one else in the world. This was just us on the street. And then we would get into the same matatu and both of us would stand because we can't afford to pay. And then we would get home and I would walk her all the way to the gate and then when we get to the gate I pass like I wasn't walking with her <laughs> so that she can leave another day. And then I would uh, run all the way back to East African School of Theology to finish my homework. And then I would leave Buruburu at 10 in the night coming home fulfilled excited and feeling like the law, I have touched the hem of his garment. Now, I hope I haven't lost you. Let's go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. Seek me. You, when you seek me, you will only find me. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So the Lord is reminding me of an episode where I sought an earthly being with all my heart. And the Lord is asking me, at what point in your life have you ever sought me like you sought Carol? And you know, all my complaining is watered down. Because I can't remember the last time I was heartbroken, or I ran because I was late for church. I can't remember the last time my heart was so broken because I didn't make it to church on time. I have never run to make it to church on time. Yet the Bible says, where two or three gather, there in their presence is God. So he's here. Yet, Even him being here and him being God and holy and almighty. (coughs) I have never run to make it here on time. And I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm saying it's not in the act of running. It's the state of my heart. I have never been so bothered in my heart that I didn't make it to church on time. Or when I'm going somewhere to preach and the jam is still here, I have never thought, you know what, I can park at a petrol station and take a border border or even run to be there on time. I sit in the traffic. And when I I get to my destination where I'm preaching, I walk in and say, guys, the jam is from hell. Please forgive me. But the truth is, If it really meant a dime for me, I would have made it on time if I wanted to. I would have found a petrol station somewhere, parked that car, paid the wochi like a red watch over this multi, get onto a border and hit the road. I don't know how many of you remember banking before mobile banking, when the banks used to close at three. And I'm telling you, you would meet men and women 
in suits, but running like madmen to make sure you're in the bank before. Kwanza Friday. Because when they closed down on Friday, by the way, the bank started operating on Saturday, just the other day. They used to close on Friday at 3. And I am telling you, if there are some powerful human beings on this earth, are those watchmen in the banks. <laughs> oh, they wielded power. One minute, a few seconds, you find him doing like this. Say, Umechelewa. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you are a CEO somewhere and you're begging. You are begging. You're begging. You know the manager by name, you even, but you don't have a mobile phone. We didn't have mobiles those days. So your friend or your relative in the back doesn't know you are there. <laughs> and so you'd find someone running in town in their suits, running. And you greet them, you greet them. No, I'm running to the bank. And you understand. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, God be with you. God be with you. Some of you have tired working when <laughs> the Lord answered our prayers. <laughs> and you're enjoying that fruit. So the Lord is challenging me here. He's asking, when was the last time? Because God can see my heart. And let me tell you something, friends. There are many of us who will never see God. Because our hearts are far from him. And he says, if you seek me, you will only find me if you seek me with all your heart. And let me tell you something. There are three people you can't lie to. You can't lie to yourself. You can't lie to the devil. And you can't lie to God anyway. Because God can see your heart. So even as you're saying, God, I'm seeking you with all my heart. How? He can see. And he remembers those days I used to crisscross. Those days of that Kahil of Kenyatta Hospital. It, used to, it, it might as well have been flat. Because I never used to notice the hill. I would go up that hill like I'm on, on, on ever ready batteries. What? And I'm telling you, I'm standing outside that bus. I didn't know that you could control your sweat. <laughs> you know, you're there. You're holding you. And she said, hi, hi, Sister Caro. <laughs> hi, Tony. How long have you been here? Not long. <laughs> Kwani, what's wrong? I'm just excited <laughs> to see you. <laughs> I'm shocked that my heart didn't get a heart attack because... <laughs> I used to slow it down. You know, you're slowing down your heart with brakes. Even the heart is. I live many years. <laughs> so here you are, you're talking to God and you're telling God, I'm seeking you with all my heart. And he can see. I have never been anxious about the things of God like that. And friends, I want to see the Lord. I want to give of myself to him. God, I want to serve you. But I also know that God is not interested in my money. He's interested in me. Because this, you are the greatest thing you can give God. He didn't die for your money. He died for you. And friends, we must come to the place of realization that as, 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 as Paul is saying, by the mercies of God, and it's by the mercy of God I'm asking Jehovah, I pray that I will seek you with all my heart so that I shall find you. I am desperate. But that desperation has not manifested into the physical. And 
is unfortunate because most of us have lived as Christians for many years. But there's a way that we have never experienced God. Why? Because we have never sought him with all our heart. Listen to what the disciples said about Jesus Christ. Listen to what the disciples, how the disciples described Jesus in their observation. Because they have observed Jesus. And this is what they said in their observation. John chapter 2 and verse 17. John chapter 2 and verse 17. Listen to what the disciples said. His disciples remembered that it was written. They remembered that it had been written. That zeal for the house of God would consume Jesus. That the zeal for the house of God would consume Jesus. Then his disciples remembered that it was written thousands of years before, zeal for your house has consumed me up. Jesus is saying that the zeal for the house of his father will consume him. And it had been prophesied that he would be consumed without zeal for the house. Psalm 69 and verse 9. Zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for the house of God will consume Jesus Christ. This is our father's house. I asked the other services today. I asked everyone who came to church today. And I ask you this question. Let me come down here. If we have different departments, so the department that is headed by our caretaker is in charge of repair and cleaning of this facility. Cleaning the toilets, making sure the seats are clean and wiped, the floor, the carpet is hoovered and clean, the walls are wiped, the glasses are, you know, sparkling. The toilets, the children's church, the grass is kept, you know, is manicured. The plants are watered and, and cleaned and wiped. If we were to retire the entire cleaning team from River of God Church today, if we told all of them you no longer have a job, on Sunday morning, would this church still look like this? If we ask those guys, you no longer have a job here. Your department is considered redundant. So we are retiring all of you. Would this church still look like this coming Sunday? Now, let me bring it to perspective. If God dealt with us the way we deal with him, because our relationship with God is financial. Our relationship with God is financial. We come to church and we give our money. And that money hires people to do things for our father and our father's house. So we pay money, we give money, and that money pays people who, who are paid to clean the altar. But the Lord desires a personal relationship that we shall be consumed by the zeal of our Father. That we don't just come here for Sunday service. That we are so consumed, we, we want to become personal. Where you're saying, you know what? I'm going to find a day when I'll come to the church and just clean. I'll, I'll hang my tie. I'll leave my jacket in the car. I come with gumboots or I come with slippers and I'll, I'll clean, I'll, I'll sweep. I'll, I'll put my title somewhere else. And I'll come to church. And, and you don't have to pay someone to clean my father's house. I'll do it. Because I want to have a personal relationship with, I want to have, not a personal relationship, but a personal encounter. Because I have zeal for my father's house. Now, let God deal with us at a financial level. So you want a breakthrough. You want healing. 
And instead of God healing you, he increases your medical insurance cover from 2 million to 5 million. So instead of healing, he increases your medical cover. You're struggling in your marriage. The Lord gives you a salary increment. Let me tell you something, friends. The, the, the real challenges in life, money can't take away. The true, ch- where it really bites, the things that really count, money can't take away. So if the Lord was to deal with us at the same level as we deal with him, because the truth is, friends, to the Christian today, in the church of Jesus Christ today, our interaction with God is financial. If the Lord was to deal with us at the same level, this would be hell on earth. And the disciples said, after he observing Jesus, they said, The zeal for his father's house consumes him. Friends, there are things you can't manufacture. You can't manufacture zeal. You can't. You you can't manufacture zeal. No wonder we do not, we are in church, but we don't see him. Yet in his presence is fullness of joy and treasures evermore in his presence. But you can only find him if you seek him with all your heart. You you must be concerned with the things of God. You must first be concerned with him that you want him in and he controls your life. And then you give of yourself for service for the Lord. And let me tell you something, friends. Service to the Lord is a family affair. Let me bring it to your attention. Joshua 24. And this blew me up. <coughs> Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. If you can open your Bible, this, 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 it just blew me up. Listen to what Joshua says. Joshua 24, 15. The Bible says this. If you think it is the wrong, it's a wrong, if you think it's the wrong thing for you to serve, that word again, if you think it is the wrong thing for you to serve the Lord, if you think it is the wrong thing for you to do what? To serve the Lord. Then choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. So if you're not serving the Lord, if you think it's wrong, then choose today who you shall serve, because the Lord desires service from us. So you choose today who you will serve. The God, the God, the serve. The gods whom your ancestors served on the other side of the Euphrates River. Or the gods of the Amorites (coughs) in whose territories you are living. But as for me, Joshua is saying, but as for me. And my household. We, that word again, we shall serve the Lord. You know, a few months ago, or late last year, I saw a member of this church. She had come to church with her children. She came to church with her children. And they were mopping the altar. It was a beautiful sight to behold. She came. I was in the office. Somebody opened. I hadn't seen. Somebody opened the door. And they forgot to put it back. So it remained ajar. Actually, it was wide open. And so I saw they were here with them struggling with the hoover to clean the place and mop. And I was like, wow. If only that was every family in this church. That on Saturday, you're taking your family for lunch. You say, you know, I'm taking you guys for lunch. And we do those things, don't we? And they're and they good things. But lunch is at 12. But we'll go to church between 11, 10 to 12. We'll go to church and we'll serve the Lord. And we'll go there and clean. And find out what is there to be done. And so, 
There are guys who will be wiping the windows, others will be arranging the seats, there are some who will be off, you know, helping in something or the other here. And then when we are done at 12, we'll go find a place for lunch. What a glorious church that would be. Where we would raise our children, we would raise a generation that is consumed with a zeal for the house of the Lord. This got to the depths of my heart. This part, this portion just got to the depths of my heart. And remember where this journey has begun. This journey began at that point where I'm trusting God for a miracle. I've been trusting God for a miracle. And I've been wondering, oh God, why aren't you coming? Niaje, how do I need to pray? And prayer is important. And so we're in that dialogue. We're in that discourse where the Lord now is saying, you know, seek me with all your heart. And I will grant you the desires of your heart. When you seek me with all your heart, I will grant you the desires of your heart. And now the Lord is interrogating my heart. And he gives me, he takes me to the past where he shows me that there was a time my heart was grabbed by this girl and how I felt running up that hill. And the Lord is saying, at what point in your Christian life have you ever been like this? And there are a few times when I was believing God for dowry. I would fast unprovoked. I'm telling you, I would go to pray in the morning and not notice it's five o'clock in the evening. My need was driving me mad. And I remember the things I used to tell God. If you don't come, cracks will show. If you don't come to fight for me, then who will? And I would challenge the Lord with his word. You said the battle is yours. Why have you forsaken me? And I would pray and cry many times. Because my heart was grieved. I needed the Lord to come through. And I sought him with everything I had. You know, you know how sometimes you go to prayer and you're distracted? You, you are praying and at some point you can't even remember at what point you stopped praying because your mind drifted. I'm telling you there are seasons in my life where even my mind was disciplined. There was no drifting. The need was so great that my mind couldn't drift. Even the devil knew this is the year. Yeah. This one don't bother. But now my struggle is focus. Focus. Many of you read the scriptures. You've read two, three chapters. And you stop and you're trying to remember what you read in the first chapter. You can't remember. It's, you have a mental block. You, you can't remember. You can't even remember any name that you read in the first chapter. You're so distracted. And you're wondering, at what point? And you wonder why, why we don't see him. You're so distracted. <laughs> Serving. Because we don't give of ourselves. We are not consumed with the basics where you say, God, I am born again. Now I need you to take my heart. I need you to be the one who sits on the driver's seat. And I remember sharing with you the story where my son is 18, he just learned how to drive, and we are going to Malindi. He has been driving for what? Four weeks? <coughs> Actually, he hasn't been driving for four weeks. He's had a driving license for four weeks. He's driven maybe two or three times to the to the supermarket. And here we are, it's at 10 in the night, and we are driving to Malindi. And I find him seated on the driver's seat. And he's saying, Dad, I'll drive you to 
My, and he's been driving for four, he's had a driving license for four weeks. And he's seated on the driver's seat, he's saying, he will take me, my wife, and my three children, him included, to Malindi. With all those trucks and buses. And in my head, and then my wife says, yeah, give him a chance. When, when will he learn? And in my head, I'm wondering, Karo, Shiro. And right there, I'm wondering, do I choose life or marriage? <laughs> so we get in, and I don't know how to say it with English. But in Chinese, we say, Nitete marana agudi. I'm holding my intestines with my hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, because I'm telling you. <laughs> It was a horrible experience. Horrible experience. I said, I was doing well before they got a drive license, until they did. And I'm telling you, the Lord answers prayer. And we started well. You know, I'm sitting in the front, and I'm wondering, if you want him to drive, why don't you sit on the front seat? No, you sit with him there so that you can guide him. You are his father. Any wives in the house? Anyway, any husband? Anyway, no, it's okay. And I'm telling you, the journey from our house to that total, just before the turning to the river, I'd lost three kilos. If we had gone on for another kilometer, I'd have muscle pulls on both legs, because I had braked. Because we'd move, uh, so, uh, pull, 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 break, 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 break. Slowly, boda, 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 boda. And it was before the expressway. And he wants to shindana with these matatus, bana. You know those matatus for Kitui that look like forward? Those ones there that, you know? You know them, eh? Those ones, you... Hey, when I see here, and my son was just, ah, ah, let it go, let it go, let it go. We are not in the safari rally, let it go, let it go. Let it go, let it go. I am telling you. My brother, Moturi. And that's how sometimes we feel when we let God sit on the driver's seat. Because it takes you to places where you don't want to go. Because this flesh rebels the things of God. This flesh. Let me tell you something. The greatest enemy to salvation is not the devil. It's your flesh. It's this flesh. This flesh. And there are many times we sit, we jump out and sit on the driver's seat and say, Jesus, here, here, let me just drive. Why? Because it takes faith. It's flesh. But friends, it's important for us to remember that trusting in the Lord is not a destination, it's a journey. It's a process. But we must start today. We can't afford to postpone it anymore. We must come to the place where we ask the Lord, I want that my heart shall be consumed by the zeal of your house. So that the overflow will go to serving others. <coughs> when you serve the Lord, the overflow is serving other people. Because it starts with the Lord. Father, my heart, I desire that my heart will be consumed. It shall be said of me, like Jesus, it was said of him by the disciples. When they said that, his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The house of God, this is God's house, that your heart will be consumed by the zeal for the house of God. And I've asked you several, and I'm, allow me to ask you this again. And, and not, I'm not asking in desperation. I'm asking as a matter of, 
interaction here. Friends, we are in June. We're in July, 7th of July. For the last 12 months, the altar of the Lord, this altar of the Lord, the place of the altar of the Lord, for the last six months, it has been cleaned by our money. It's our shillings and cents that has cleaned the altar of God, not us. The place where we come for healing, the place where we come to meet our Father. When you come here with a need and you bow your knee and you're saying, God, here I am, meet with me. Here, here. It is our money that cleans the altar of God at river of God. Not our hands. Yet, when we call him, we want him to come and not to send anyone. Don't send an angel. Come in person. And this is a personal this is not a corporate question. It's, it's a personal question. It's personal. Uriah, Uzziah, when he touched the ark and he died, David was angry because he was doing a good thing. But it was not in his place to touch the holy things. Because first of all, the holy, the, the ark should not be on a, on, a, on a cart. It should have been on the shoulders of men. And God had designated which family that it would, would carry that. Not just anyone. Why? Because he wants a personal relationship with man. That's why his ark, the carrying of his ark was personal. On the shoulders of men. Not on an ark. Not on a cart. Whether, it is made of, whether the ark was made of gold or not. He had prescribed that it be carried on the shoulders of men. Friends, the Lord still desires a personal relationship, a personal walk with each one of us. He won't change this scripture to fit us. He won't change this scripture to fit your schedule. He won't change this scripture to fit your sense of importance in society. He wouldn't. I remember those days when we would go to the village to visit my grandmother and we would go to church. In those days, the churches in the village didn't have flush toilets. They didn't even have those Indian ones. They had the whole, you know those? Those are the toilets in Chad. And so we would go to church. And when we are going to church, on Saturday, my grandmother would carry ash and water. There are a few ladies who would be assigned. The ladies that live on that ridge will bring ash on Saturday. And so we would help our grandmother carry ash to the church. And because you pour the ash in the toilet and then you sweep it. Because it's a public toilet. They would pour the ash. And you know, it's earthen, eh? So you'd pour the ash and then sweep it, and it looks spectacular. By the way, the ash is amazing. It takes away even the smell. And so the toilets are ready for Sunday morning. And then there would be another ridge that would be assigned to clean the church. And then we would carry the water to the church because you go fetch the water and then you carry it to the church. <coughs> they washed the house of God with their hands. With their bare feet. And they would wash singing with gladness. And they had never been to school. But those illiterate, poor, shoeless women raised doctors and engineers and teachers and professors and billionaires because God honored their sacrifice. Because they did it with such glee. And then they would sing all the way back home. 
with his grandchildren after they had cleaned the toilet. They didn't think it was beneath them to pour ash in the toilet and wash and sweep it and pour ash again and sweep it and, and then, you know, clean and remove the cobwebs on the side and they would be singing and dancing as they're washing that toilet, you know, and, and they're singing to the Lord. in vernacular songs, and would be there wondering, why would someone be excited to wash a toilet? Because that toilet is not just another toilet. That toilet is the, in the house of the Lord. She's excited because she's washing the toilet of her father in heaven. That's why she's excited. It's not just any other toilet. And some of you here, Remember that story. Because it was the same in your village. Chances are it was the same in your village, Jemima. Kokomba, chances are it was the same. It was the same for all of us. It wasn't about tribe. It was every city, every village. I'm sure it was the same with Mrs. Mudas and your grandmother. You're seated here today because God remembered your grandmother's sacrifice. Yet you have never held a broom in your father's house. What heritage will you leave your grandchildren? How will they say you served God? What did they see you do for the God you love? For the God you say has done for you great and mighty things. What did you, what did you ever do for him that money couldn't buy? What did you ever do as a heritage for your grandchildren that money couldn't buy. I'm telling you, money is the cheapest form of giving. Money is the cheapest form of giving. May the Lord have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Do you desire honor? John 12, 26. Honor among men. If anyone serves me, Jesus says, he must follow me. For you to serve him, you must be a follower of Christ. And where I am, there my servant will also be. And where was Jesus? He was about his father's business. So you also must be about your father's business. Whether it's in the corporate world, you are in the service of humanity. If anyone serves me, as Jesus said, if anyone serves me, the father will honor him. If anyone serves me, if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. Some of you seated where you sit, who you are and what you have, is God honoring that old lady. who cleaned those toilets, who cut the grass, who brought flowers to the Lord's hearth. Who would come to church carrying a few eggs and a chicken as a fast fruit. 
they would never forget that of these chicks, this is the one that was born first. And they would make sure that it's the best. And they would bring a few eggs as fast fruit and a chicken to the house of the Lord and say, this is my fast fruit. It's interesting. In Nehemiah, when they were reestablished in Israel, two rooms were created. One for firewood so that the altar would never grow cold. And a room for fast fruits. Because God would expect that we would never forget to say thank you. Honor begets honor. Honor begets honor. I remember carrying sweet potatoes because my grandmother didn't have money. She gave what she had. She'd carry sweet potatoes to church because that was her offering. With such excitement. I remember she would step on the stone and, and take panga soap. <coughs> and when it lathers, she would lift her dress and then, and then she would shine like oil. I, I don't, how, how many of you remember that? And it works, by the way. Lather and then, and with her two, shoe, two, two feet without shoes. And then she would walk to church with her car. Kagasha dress, you know, how, what do you say Kagasha with in English? Her stained dress. Her, no, it's not faded. It's stained dress, yeah. You know, it used to be white. Now it's not off white, it's almost yellow. It's almost pale, eh? It's, and, you know, and then her, with her grandchildren going to church. And we would walk a distance. This one is carrying this, this one is carrying eggs. The other one is carrying this and she would go singing. And then they would meet with other women as they are going and then it becomes a crowd and we are all going to church with our grandmother and they are so happy, they are singing all the way there. And then when they get there, when the worship starts and they sing with that kadram and they would, oh my God, and then they would sit and listen to the word and they can't read for themselves. And when the Bible is being read, they spin, drop, silent. Because they can't read for themselves. That's the only time they have an opportunity to interact with Scripture. And then they would come home remembering the stories they had about Scripture. And she would quote like she knows exactly where it is. So if the pastor got it right, the whole entire community got it wrong. I mean, if the pastor got it wrong, the entire community got it wrong. And on Monday morning, she would start looking for what she would take to the house of the Lord on Sunday. Because it was about God. Everything was about Jehovah, their God. The greatest gift that God gave my grandmother was me, was saving me. She said it one time. I'll say it in my mother tongue and then I'll say it in English. Gaya reda. Gua kwane kwage amude jeri gai. God is gracious. No, God is merciful. My home. There's a priest. That her home has a priest. Everything she had done for God, he remembered her sacrifice. And there's a priest in her home. And then she died. Friends, I'm telling you, the 21st century church is shallow. The things of God don't move our heart anymore. We are no longer consumed by the things of God. Our interaction with him is mechanical. It's not from the heart. That's why young people on the street accusing the church. 
threatening that they are coming to restore the church of Jesus Christ. Let's stand on our feet as we conclude. Father, this, this afternoon we raise a prayer of repentance. Forgive us, Almighty God, because we have lost it. We have lost it. We are no longer about serving you, but serving self. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us. And may you rekindle the love for serving our God everywhere we are, whether it's in the community, whether it's in church, whether it's on the streets, wherever we are, that we shall serve you. That there will be a joy, there will be a fulfillment in serving. Jehovah, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Because truly, you have been good to us. You have blessed us. You have honored us. You have fought for us. You have healed us. You have provided for us in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. You have fought battles that no one could have fought for us. And so we cannot truly say that you have not been with us, even in our lowest. Today we ask, in humility, in brokenness, and in repentance, a shame and saddened by who we have become, each one of us, me included, that Lord shall be said of us that we are consumed by the zeal for the house of our Father and by serving humanity. but in humility and in brokenness by your grace and by your mercy. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you remember Kenya and remember the church of Jesus Christ. We pray this because we believe and trust in Jesus' name. As you live today, may the Lord shine his face upon each one of you. May his favor be evident over each of our lives. May none of our bones ever be broken. May what is ours that the devil has taken or touched, may our God in heaven restore to us a hundredfold. May the peace of God that surpasses human understanding, may that peace keep our hearts. May the joy of the Lord fill and saturate every inch of our homes. May it be our portion. May we never forget, may we remember that we have the power of life and death on our tongue. And so we declare life over the nation of Kenya, over everything that surrounds our life, over the nation of Kenya, the nation of Israel, and as the Lord may lead you. And on every road you travel on, declare on this road today, with the authority given to you by the Lord, that on this road, within or without this nation, that you will declare no one will lose their life or have their property destroyed on that road. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel Go with you this week.